my parents called me Eilish, like like an yeah. A Eilish, you know. It's, but, that's cute. Mm. I love it. Um, I'm Magda, so I'm Magdalena, but then I'm Magda, but with my parents and grandparents, I was always Magda. So we all have. Oh, that's nice. Anyway. I didn't know that. Yeah. Magda. Oh. Cool. Magda. Yeah. So if you want to be nice to me, Cindy, you can call me Magda. If you want to Magda. yell at me, you can call Magda. me Magdalena Veronica. <laughs> I like that I'm, name. I'm, yeah. I'm gonna practice. Yes, I'll get that right. Cool. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, I'm gonna hand over to Cindy and I'll be in the background. So I will see you guys at the end for CCEU stuff. Oh, wonderful. See you later. Thank you. Hi, everyone. And hello to all our listeners on YouTube. Um, I, I trust everyone's doing well under their own lockdowns and um, staying indoors and taking care of themselves. Um, I'd love to introduce you to our speaker for today. And she's a colleague, friend, um, and we know each other in quite a few roles. So Elise is an MCC coach, just a little bit about her. She's an MCC coach. <clears throat> and she has you know, over 30 years of experience around the public, private and volunteer spaces. And she's worked a lot in management level for the Irish Department of Health for around 20 years. Um, she plays many other roles as facilitator, conflict coach and conversational intelligence coach. Um, I met Elish when in, I think, 2016, when during our time as president, she with the I ICF um, Ireland chapter. Cindy, I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but I'm getting lots of comments and we can't hear you. And also there's background noise, I think, from your hands. So just maybe keep your microphone a bit closer. Okay, keep my hands still. And That's much better. Okay. Okay, so, hmm, I don't know where to start with. Okay, let me let me say this about Elish. She's a qualified facilitator, conflict coach, conversational intelligence coach, and she's held the role of president for High CF Ireland since in 2017. And it was during that time that she brought Judith Glacier, the author of Conversational Intelligence, to Highland to speak about conversational intelligence and run a number of workshops, engagements, et cetera. And I'll let, as, as the webinar go on, I'm sure you'll discover a whole lot more about Elish and um, engage, I mean, an encouragement to engage with us, engage on the topic and um, enjoy. With that, Elisha, hand over to you. Thank you very much, Cindy. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, thank you for inviting me here today to speak um, on the topic of coaching and leadership. And um, I, I'm, I just want to open up by saying we are all experiencing challenging times and we are connected through this uh, COVID-19, the dreaded COVID-19, in a way that we were never connected before and yet we're not flying the airways to one another, but we're still connected with that by with the actual virus. Anyway, and I have been heartbroken, as I'm sure many of you have, with the number of people who have passed on with the virus. And my own daughter-in-law has had the virus. She's just got over it. So I, I just want to sympathize or empathize with anyone out there who may be having somebody in the family with the virus. And that uh, I hope everything works out well. So with that, I just get started. And I have done a little bit of preparatory work. And as Cindy said, she's been a good friend and colleague of mine since I met her at 2016 in the ICF at Portugal. So, uh, and she's been my mentor for my MCC. Um, I wanted to start off by telling you a little story about a book I wrote, it, uh, no, not I wrote, sorry, I read, and it's called The Road Less Traveled. And it's quite, it's old, it's about 30 years old, but it was a book that changed my life significantly because it set me out on a journey of personal development. From that, I did the Myers-Briggs, I did other, um, personal uh, tools and in that book 
because the topic today is listening actively and we're looking at the competency of ICF uh, listening actively, I just revi reviewed the section on, he talks about the work of attention and he talks about attending a conference where there was a sage speaking. And to cut a long story short, during the entire thing, he had headaches from concentrating on what was being said. And the upshot of that was, was when he was coming out, people were saying, oh, uh, that wasn't really much good, was it? And he determined that they hadn't been really actively listening. And so he determined that active listening. And he said that listening requires our attention. It's hard work and it requires concentration. So also um, he described about pretend listening and, and I say in these times of COVID-19, we're all doing a little bit of that with family and that because sometimes when children are around you and you're cooking or whatever, and you're just saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he talked about pretend listening, selective listening. And I used to do this as training in management uh, sometimes to, pe to our staff. And I also then later on came across Steve Covey and the seven habits of highly effective people. And in that book, what really resonated with me, he talked about empathic listening. He was adding another layer to my slides. And empathic listening is really listening with your head and listening with your heart. And like when I came to know Judith Glaser and understand, and even maybe some of you have studied uh, heart math and that, how the heart is really connected with the brain. So he was, that was Steve Covey, the late Steve Covey. And so, I, I was using that because I had studied management and I was using it in my work and practicing with my colleagues, practicing, uh, you know, with, with people that report to me. And then I became a hospital manager around 2001. And the skill that I used then that I want to impart to you was about questions. And you may have seen these yourself, what, when, where, how, and why. And these were the questions. But I, I used what and how as my questions all the time. And I want to tell you what I did. When staff would come into me, maybe very angry, upset, it could be like that a member of the public came in, or it could be that uh, it was a manager. Uh, would come in to me and they'd be very angry or emotional or very stressed. What I found really worked, and I learned about it later what I was doing, but I didn't know that they were in the emotional state, the amygdala sometimes, and I was taking them out of that into the prefrontal cortex with my questions, what and how. So I would say invariably, and I can think of one example that I came in and said, what, what happened? And she explained the whole story to me. And I said, how do you want me to deal with that? And, you know, she said, well, I need to talk. At, I want to talk to you more about it. And I said, well, I really have to go to that person, find out from them, and then maybe we'll come together and both of us will sit down and we talk through it and get a resolution. So over and over, I used that as a technique in, uh, it wasn't so much a technique, it was something I really believed in because I was empathizing. But what I do know that I've tried and tested that over the five years I was in that role and it works every time and what you're really doing is listening to the person you're valuing them but you're also helping them to move out of that emotional state and what i noticed in the anger is that and i do believe this myself that people who are angry are often hurting inside and that hurt uh, is because maybe sometimes they haven't been listened to and so I, I, it just worked. And I had, uh, through that uh, system of working, I um, had relatively low industrial relations problems at my hospital for the period I was there. And so I'm just pausing for a moment, if that's all right. Um, so I, I, I was preparing for today and I was wondering how would I prepare and, you know, what examples would I give you? And um, I suppose uh, one example that comes to mind is when I was dealing with somebody who reported to me very, very stressed and she was, um, she was dealing with somebody, her manager, who was really not very nice. He was controlling and she was a very good worker and she was uh, had targets to meet and she was very responsible. So she came to me to 
really, in a way, I was coaching her. I was most definitely coaching her. And I observed this in her. So I just said to her, could you just tell me, where are you feeling that right now? And she said, um, no, I'm not feeling it. I'm just thinking it, she said. You know, she pointed to her head. No, I'm thinking it. And um, I just paused again for a few minutes and thought about, you know, I suppose I was trying to figure out how, how could I move this on for her. So I just said to her, um, one thing I will say about you in your time working here, I know you're very professional and I know that you want to do a good job and that you're highly motivated and that you really have the skills for what it is you're expected to do. Well, within seconds, she came out of this headspace down into and she got a bit emotional and tearful. And what that did really was, um, it was really bringing her down out of her head and into her heart. And in actual fact, she had been emotional, but wasn't realizing that she was emotional because she was thinking in her head, you know. So I suppose um, we could ask a question, maybe what experience have people had of that type of, uh, you know, emotional, you know, somebody being emotional, has anyone had that experience or what did they think? Are there any comments? Um, as we wait for the comments, uh, which Cindy will have on, uh, Ailish just wanted to request, maybe move your scarf a tiny bit because oh. it keeps hitting, uh, the microphone keeps hitting your scarf. Oh, and right. then Sorry, I can take it off. <laughs> Sorry Perfect. about that. Sorry about that. I'll be gone again. So the question yeah. was, has anyone experienced something similar? Yeah. Yeah, who, who has experienced something uh, similar? And Elise, I have a question for you, because as you were talking earlier on when you started, you said something quite interesting that I'd like to pick up. But let's first ask your question that you just did. Um, who's experienced something similar with regards to having emotions that were sitting with them and didn't really notice it? Oh, please share, I mean, uh, yeah, not a yes and a no, please share, you know, how you managed it or dealt with it or your insights from it. And you know, Cindy, uh, just adding to that, it was like a light bulb moment for me and for her because I thought, oh my goodness, I, I was in the moment with her, you know, like dealing with it in the moment. And I had no idea that was going to happen you know, I was trying to understand what was going on with her. And for both of us, it was a, a, an aha, as Oprah would say, an aha moment. I mean, as we're waiting for people to, to come in, I, I can share um, because yeah. I feel for me, like, especially in the past year, um, I've become much more aware of my own emotions. And, um, you know, when I think back to, especially interacting with my parents uh, in the past, I would often, I think if there was anger or frustration or something in the back, I would express it differently and it didn't make a very good conversation. And then um, Ram taught me set sensations, emotions, and thoughts. Oh. And I've been using that, um, you know, it was in the context of, of coaching, but I've been using that kind of for self-coaching for myself. And um, I've learned, I guess, trained myself to kind of recognize when there's an emotion happening that I wasn't expecting and I can just take a quick pause and check in with myself and just have that inner conversation and helps me identify the emotion so that I can, you know, behave appropriately and not be blindsided by whatever is happening. Yeah, because really what's happening to you in that moment is you're being triggered, you know, mm. and I've done conflict coaching and we talk about triggers in conflict coaching. And it's a great skill to have, like, to, to know what your triggers are. So if you were reflecting back and maybe even just pick one incident with your parents and write out, what was it that triggered me in that moment? Because when you find oh. out what your trigger <laughs> is, when you find out what your trigger is, then the next time it happens, once you become aware you say, oh, they're pushing that button again. So I'm going to have a different response to it. So that's what I would suggest for you. 
but there's a lot more to it than that, you know, but uh, upskilling somebody in uh, conflict management is dealing with a live, a live um, situation and helping the person through that by looking at the mutuality, what was going on for you, what was going on for them, you know. Hmm. And Magda, what I notice is, you know, for quite some time now, you, you're quite good at picking up what's happening inside of you and verbalizing that. And, you know, so the internal and the external, you're actually very good with listening around that, listening to yourself, listening to others around you. Thank you. It's honestly coach training. It's you and Ram and um, <laughs> my universe right now. <laughs> Thanks, Cindy. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. So Elish, when you were, so let me do a framing. You know, the topic today is around how we partnering and are we listening? And Elish is gonna pick up examples and her own wisdom from organizational experience around leadership and the experience around coaching and in the interactions with multiple layers, people around different layers. And it's not just listening, she's also gonna talk about the communication part. And the one thing I heard you talk about right in the beginning, Elish, was around listening and building trust. And, you know, I like to pay attention to this and really see what impact listening has on building trust. So I'd love for you to share your wisdom around that. And you know, while you are talking, please would I just invite all our attendees to also share your own wisdom around how does listening build trust or what are you noticing around building trust when you're really listening to someone? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, it really is. And I suppose it's something that comes up very much in the training of conversational intelligence. And um, when I mentioned earlier about Steve Covey, because I love Steve Covey and the seven habits of highly effective people, I think I did mention that, did I? And he like he gives you the seven habits and he talks about the empathic. Yeah. So he's saying listening with your eyes and listening with your heart and it's your whole body. And in a way, you know, we talk now about the gut brain and the heart brain. And for me, uh, listening is being fully present to the person. And we're talking about ICF competency, listening actively. And for me to listen actively all everything must be in gear it's a bit like that man scott peck you have to be present to the person and you'll know this yourself if somebody is listening to you and they are uh, giving you their full attention and you can listen with your eyes and ears and that make, makes you authentic, but it also builds self-esteem in the person. And that's what I found with those people who reported to me, or it could be the general public, and it could be a very serious matter they're coming into me with. But once you, um, and, and I did have a situation with a family where their mum had a problem on the wards and they were coming in and it was a potential lawsuit, it really was. And we brought them up into the room and they talked about it and the normal, and they've proven this in risk management that if you just say you're sorry, but that's not, I was genuinely uh, dealing with these people. And I said to them, you know, my own mother has been in hospital and I, she didn't have that problem, but I just said, I totally get what you're saying. And I'm really sorry that that happened your mother. Well, the energy in the room changed immediately because the people felt they were being listened to. And if someone else maybe had dealt with that in a different way, there could have been, and, and it has come up in my time as, as a manager, it came up over and over in the health service that people would say that, they just didn't listen to us, you know? And so to say about trust, you start to trust somebody who's listening to you because you believe, and, and again, like I was thinking about that earlier and we were talking about theory you and uh, open heart open mind open will and it all it's all one story that's how i see it it's all one story because we are just a human with head heart and gut and everything in between and the amygdala which my daughter would liken to the smoke alarm when the amygdala goes off or the smoke alarm goes off in the house there isn't usually a fire and practically there isn't ever a fire but occasionally there may be 
And so the amygdala is almost like the fire alarm going off in the house. And it's where fear sets in. And that's what uh, Magda was just talking about the, with her parents and what was going on inside her. And so if we learn to calm that down, and I would be training people for interview in career coaching, and I would always say to them, once you get that calm down, you have the whole of your brain at your disposal, you know. And so you, that's how you build trust with somebody, by being present. And if you look at the competencies, Cindy, and you know them better than I do, all the ICF competencies, you couldn't say one that didn't have a listening aspect to it. Am I correct? So, so Elish, um, I'm just going to take off, remove my headset because I see people cannot hear me. So I'm just going to check with you. You can hear me, right? Oh, I can hear you, yeah. Yeah, I think this is better now. Um, that's, a that's, that's a lovely way of putting it because you're absolutely right. I think that's the very essence of coaching, right? Are we listening? How we, and that also determines how we're partnering with the client or clients or just anybody in general, the way we listen to them as an impact on how we partner with them or how we respond to them. Yeah. And like I, I have had a success with that and dealing with that with uh, some coaching clients and uh, interview training. And it's really around that listening skill and teaching them how to do that when they go to interview and how they connect with the board and all of that. And there's actually a case study on the Creating We website I just saw this week and it's my case study. So if anybody wanted to go in and do a little tour around it, it's there. And uh, she had failed her interview the year before with 300. Where, where is it? Sorry, sorry, where? It's on the Creating We where website. Where is it, Elish? Where can people? The Creating, oh, creating we, we website. Okay. Yeah. Thank and you. Uh, uh, this girl, and she, uh, she gave full permission for me to disclose everything. And she um, had been in an interview uh, with 300 people and hadn't got the interview. And she came to me for coaching. And I taught her those skills and I all, like there was a lot more to it and she did her homework fair play to her. But I told her about calming the amygdala because when she'd had a previous experience because of the way the brain works and the mirror image, you know, the pattern matching, I was telling her how to dispel that and how that she would have the whole of her brain at her disposal if she could keep it calm. Well, she, she called me after the interview and she came 26th on the panel out of 300 the next time. So I thought, well, that works, you know. So the whole thing that we're discussing here is about respecting people, isn't it? And putting a value on the people in our lives. And like I say, it's very good to practice it with your family members, you know, especially in the COVID times, I'd say you would be challenged. I know I've been challenged a few times. We've settled in nicely now here at home, but in the beginning, I think we were challenged, you know, uh, <laughs> being locked down together. So I, I, I was going to go on, Cindy, and talk about um, Judith coming to Ireland, if that, or did you want to feed back anything from the chat box? Yeah, no, I was going to say to you, earlier on you picked up, you know, in during the COVID, how we're listening to each other, and you mentioned selective listening. I think all sorts of listening is beginning to show up, right? Yeah, yes, because selective listening is just hearing what you want to hear. So maybe you're interested yeah. in, in sailing and there's a conversation and you just zone in on the piece that you and you block out the rest and you haven't even heard it. It's interesting, isn't it? Mm. Absolutely. So I was going to invite our participants, you know, what are you noticing about listening to the people you locked down with? Um, during That's this a time. really good question. What are you noticing? Yeah, what are you noticing about your own listening? Because you're right. I mean, I find myself sometimes attentively listening or actively listening, and at times half listening, you know, very selective in what I'm listening to and listening for. Um, yeah, so, I'm, so I, I would imagine many different types of listening is beginning to show so you know you'll be going to just broaden the topic a bit more on how we on listening so please tell us the story of of um judith's visit to highland 
Yeah, well, I suppose I studied conversation. I, I came across Judith at a WBEX webinar in 2014. And, you know, you had to feedback who was the best speaker. So obviously a lot of people said Judith. And I really, she talked about her life's work and how she had spent 50 years, uh, most of her life up to then studying conversations and conversational intelligence connectivity and how we connect with others through conversation. And um, so I did, I did the conversational intelligence course and I'm certified in it. But during that time, I really, I was ICF vice president and I tried to get Judith to Ireland. But one really sad thing is that Judith announced on the very first day of the course that she'd been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. So that was really a bummer for the whole lot of us, including Judith. And I was hoping she'd be well enough maybe to travel to Ireland. But then she took some kind of a setback at the end of 2016. But anyway, she came to Ireland in 2017 and I spent eight days with her and her lovely husband, Richard. And sadly, she passed away in November 2018. And she was very loved by the people that she taught. And she was prayed for a lot on those calls and modules. And one thing I will say is that she was a brilliant communicator and connector. And that's the quality I admired most in her being in our presence, because some people like can talk, say, but then they don't practice it. But I witnessed her practicing what she was preaching. And you would feel very important if you asked Judith a question on her modules or on her webinar, because she, it was like no one ever asked that question before. You know, she had a it wasn't a technique, it was who she was. Because when I was in her presence, and I used to tell her, you're a guru, G-U-R-U, -U, you know, because she was a guru, you know. And uh, I suppose when we were talking there about, um, I don't know if I mentioned about synergy, about, you know, we're talking about some things that are in Judith's book that I haven't time to go into now, and it's not the right forum for it. But she talks about, um, the levels of listening that we all learned in our coach training and she talks about um synergy and sharing but steve covey talks about that you know i think it's the sixth habit is uh the synergy that we get if we share things with people and say you're in a management meeting and you're not agreeing with what's being said so it's somebody with an alternative view and so people take up positions you know and it's really important, and I was listening to Kavi saying this, you know, that you could say, you know, I, I have a different opinion to what you have. Let's sit down and let's talk about what it is that uh, you want and see if we can come to an agreement. And he would always say that that's where synergy takes place. So two plus two could equal five, 10, 100. You know, so that's another um, way of looking at the, the management. And there's another uh, story I was going to tell, and it's about Judith, a question I asked her. Now, it was nothing to do with my course. She didn't, I don't think she even knew who I was, but maybe, I'm not sure if it was open or it was just CIQ open on Facebook. But I had a question that I wanted to ask. It was very timely. So I said, what would you do, Judith, if you were in a team meeting? And you were organizing the team and sharing it. And one of the team members who really wasn't productive uh, in their own role and came to the meeting with very little, they challenged you and they, um, in a way, took you down in the meeting. What would you do? You know? And so she said straight away, which I was surprised. Now, when I have those conversations with Richard, that was her husband, she immediately related it to her husband. And Richard presses my buttons, and it's a bit like what Magda was saying there. When your buttons are pressed, she said, what I do in that case, I say, Richard, I'm not going to talk to you now about that. I'm going to take time and I'm going to reflect on what's just happened and why I'm feeling so emotional. And when I, when I understand that, I come back and we can have an open discussion. So that was her answer to my question, you know? So that was interesting. Yeah. I, I spoke to her just once. I had the pleasure of speaking to her just once when I 
invited her to do a webinar. And she just didn't engage me in the webinar. She went on to talk about like an entire page email, you know, talking to me about South Africa and um, and love for it and she had visited and yeah, she went on to talk so much more. So you're right when you said, if you ask Judith a question, you become the most important person. Mm. It's as if she's hearing it for the very first time. Yeah, she was very unique in that way. Like she was a guru. Like you don't really come across many Judiths in your lifetime. And I I'd have worked hard at it. And, you know, I would have worked hard at it for my uh, MCC to become a good listener. And sometimes I got that wrong. And, and I would say to anyone who's <clears throat> going for any form of credentialing with ICF to stick with it because you will get there. <clears throat> and even at this stage, I think, and you might agree that, like you said, we don't always do the listening, particularly when we go home and we're locked in. <laughs> I'm on mute. Absolutely, spot on. English, you know, I've, I've heard you talk a lot about Judith, I mean, not on this way, but prior to this too, in many of our conversations, and you would speak about the impact she had on you. So in imparting, in imparting skills, what were you taking away from your interactions with, your, with her? Yeah, well, I suppose it was that she made me feel I was important. You know, she made me feel that I mattered and that what I said mattered to her and made a difference in her life. She just, and it's like what you said when you contacted her. So it was that she seemed to have that effect on everyone she came in contact with. And I suppose that's what set her apart really, you know, but she had studied the conversation intelligence for many, many, many years and put it into practice. And she gives many examples, you know, if you're training in conversation intelligence of different organizations and using different techniques. And she does describe in her book, the arc of engagement, which, which goes on to be the dashboard and how she, uh, how she started out with that and how that, I, I suppose she started to put the levels of listening into the dashboard that we're all aware of. And like that thing of, you know, when you're in a coaching session or even when you're in a meeting, part of the meeting is about information. There's an agenda and it's about sharing information. And then there's a deeper part of it of what's the dynamic going on in the meeting, you know, and is somebody in the meeting misbehaving? And I've observed that in meetings where maybe somebody is smiling over. It actually happened to me, to be honest with you, uh, where somebody was almost sniggering over to another person. And I was the chair of the meeting and um, what I did in that situation, I just said, I called the person out and I said, I'm just noticing you're smiling over it. Do you want to share with us what it is um, you're talking, your, you know, what that's about? And that's another way of handling that in, a, in a, a meeting. And that person then had to open up and say what it was, you know, and they were very taken aback. And what it does, if you're, if you're managing meetings or if you're a leader, it puts a stop to that kind of negative behavior in meetings, you know? I can yeah. lip read, you said absolutely, Cindy. <laughs> Just listening when you can't even hear me. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. So at least this idea of conversational intelligence, now, before I ask you to explain or to talk a little bit about it, I also want to say to our participants that in, in this, uh, how do I say this? In the spirit of talking about this topic, conversational intelligence, there are some contractual um, matters in the background that, which is, you know, Alicia's made a decision not to to share screen and talk about or, or really pick up any tools around Judith Glacier's work. But there's a lot available on the internet. So if you want to go and have a look and listen to some videos, um, Google Judith's work on conversational intelligence, you're most welcome to do that. It's on the internet. 
it's just um, because of contractual matters. We were not going to share screens and do any kind of um, discussions around that. But Elish, may I invite you to talk about, you know, what is conversational intelligence for you? Yeah, well, I think we're, we're, we're saying it's about connectivity, which is what Judith said. So what is a conversation? It's two people exchanging information, or it could be a group of people exchanging information. And it's really about valuing the people around you, respecting them. And I know that in organizations, because I've been there, we have all sorts of policies, procedures, governing documents for corporates. You know, there's everything there and you have to abide by them in a lot of cases. But in meetings, you know, it's really important to, um, well, particularly what I would say in conversational intelligence and meetings is like I said, calling out things, but also if something is resonating with you in here, it's okay to say it rather than carry it away from the meeting and never have said it. I would say be brave enough to say it because that's the kind of thing that Judith would say and do, you know? And sometimes it's fear that holds us back. And when we actually get it out there, you say, what was I afraid of? What was that? That, you know, so it's that little voice when we were taught coaching, the little gremlin in your head that tells us you couldn't do that and you blah, 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 you know. And I have another example, Judith, that I wanted to share because I think it's an important example for uh, people dealing with managers and maybe somebody difficult in a meeting, somebody who's really difficult and they're maybe being bullyish and they have a seniority over you and you have to deal with them. And I was uh, dealing with a girl, she was actually in the management team, not in my area at all. And um, she came to me for counsel on it and we talked over the whole thing and I happened to know this person and she was really I was listening and listening and really she was in the role of not so much a victim because she was quite intelligent and she was a senior manager herself but she was um seemingly unable to come to a solution to how to deal with it we were working on what she could do so just and I did this in the training interview with with the girl uh, in the case study I said just for a minute will we switch places and I sat her down in my chair and I sat in her chair and I said to her, now I want you to ask me the questions that I was asking you and I'm going to be you. So it was like a role play. So I carried out a role play with her for what I was hearing. And oh my God, you know, Cindy, it was the greatest fun ever. And oftentimes we looked back and we laughed. She took into the fit of giggles and everything going out the door. And she actually, that situation that she was dealing with, she transformed it through, through. So it was almost like stepping into another's shoes. And if you, if, you, if you notice that even in conversation intelligence or that's something we're asked to do, you know, have the empathy, see what's going on. And like I was saying earlier, if something is triggering you in a conflict, because you know, different things can trigger us. And it doesn't mean that the other person's a bad person. It can be that they're under some severe pressure that you haven't thought of. And sometimes if you just go through the motions of what was going on in me, what was going on in them, have I any idea? Sometimes that can shift um, that trigger and then you don't really fall into that trap again, you know? So I, I just thought that was a nice story and a nice learning for me even that, that that was working. And then I went on to use that in my coaching practice, you know, uh, for particularly, I use it quite a lot if I'm doing interview training. I get people to switch around and I'm the applicant and they are the, the people on the board, you know. It's very effective. Uh, I, I mean, I know you were sharing this while uh, 10 minutes before we could start. So I'm just gonna right. pick that up with you. I'll pick that up with you again, because the conversation was cut short. We had to appear on this call. Um, you know, I'm, I'm this word empathy. I'm finding myself learning all sorts of nuances and meanings around empathy in, the time, in this time of uh, COVID-19. It's like a different kind of engagement with that word on different levels. 
Yeah. And you were talking about empathy in your role as director for health services, sorry, manager for health services, and now you're engaged with your team. You, you want to talk a little bit more about that because we'd love to hear. Yeah, well, empathy, you know that Brené Brown has a little, it's a lovely little art thing on YouTube. I love it. I love listening to it. It's about two minutes and it's about empathy and sympathy. And she says, uh, I think, now let me get this right, that empathy is I feel with you, but sympathy is I feel for you. And empathy mm -hmm. is not sympathy, you know. So, um, yeah. You know, you're not always going to get along with everyone at work. And that's like the point Steve Covey was making about the synergy, you know, but we're all adults. And I always said that we're all adults. And, you know, the transaction analysis, I don't know if you know anything about that uh, parent, adult and yeah. child and how, you know, we can fall into the traps of parent, adult and child. And um, I, I think that we have to behave in an adult way we're, when we're in the working environment. And sadly, sometimes that doesn't happen. And it may be that the person wasn't ever given the skills. And sometimes you have to call it out. And Judith in her training in conversational intelligence gives many examples of disruptive CEOs. And one I think I can share with you that, you know, she would have talked about here in Ireland was um, this CEO, and believe it or not now, he... Uh, was very he'd check off the reports with a red pen and these were all adults and he would uh, he was very much a dictator and then it was Thanksgiving night and you know in the United States that's a big deal Thanksgiving and I'm sure in India or South Africa and uh, St. Patrick's Day in Ireland I don't know what it is and so he called a meeting right at the time you would have your Thanksgiving dinner and they had to attend it because he said, oh, we have clients in Europe and we need to have you um, present for the meeting. So Judah talks about having coached him then later. And I don't think she directly confronted him. But when they came back to Ju Judith had done discovery interviews with them about what was going on in the team. And he said, uh, she said that the, the team said, what did you do to him? What did you do to him? Because he started sending them out, uh, like Cindy, uh, I'd like to know your opinion on this matter. And he started engaging with them. And it's, you see how you can turn something around, even a person you think there's no hope for. And we do see some of those in the workplace. And I'm sure some of the people on the call might know some, but we're all adults and we all need to uh, behave as adults. That's my opinion anyway. Uh, I don't know if that answered your question, did it? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I find myself going in and out of mute and taking a second or two to do that. So please excuse me for that. No, and okay. I'm trying to also keep an eye on the chat. So you can probably see my attention drift from your face into the chat to see if there's any questions there. Coaches, if you have any questions for Elish, please type it into the chat box or into the q and a also if you would like to join the panel and ask a question yourself feel free to do so we thought we'll keep today's session in conversation because then we can share from real life experiences especially elisha's experience around work and the multiple levels of um, people engagement that she's been a contributor with and of Right, Alish? Because there were yes. so many layers there, right? It's not yeah. just work. Oh, definitely, yeah. There's, there's all the layers, yeah. And I suppose I've worked in various roles, like I've worked nationally with management and unions. And in that, is, in that instance, you'd be using a lot of your conflict management because it would be people in difficulty, you know, and you'd be trying to find out what's the underlying problem, what lies beneath. So it would be, um, you know, dealing with management and union and then trying to get them to come to agreements on, on various matters, you know, so I, I have worked in that and I've, um, I suppose I've been the lead, I didn't mention that, funny enough, I've been the lead in developing coaching and mentoring within the health service and in that time I set up the triads and the networks and practice triads and I think, um, you know, learning how, how our people um, 
you know, became coaches and how that transformed the organization into a culture of coaching. And I think we got the, um, I was gone out of the organization. We got the uh, ICF, what's that award? Is it PRISM? Prism. Prism Award in Prism 19, Award. 20, 2018, yeah. yeah. And so that was because of the culture of coaching. And I've worked with uh, directors of nursing on supervision of coaching. And I found that training and coaching is a huge asset to a manager because it does help you to understand the other person. And, you know, you listen more. I think you listen with empathy, you know. So I'm looking at the chat um, to look for any questions. And I have a feeling that I could have missed a few. Uh -huh. If you had asked a question and it's not in the front of the chat, please will you copy and repaste your question? So there's something here. Someone is bullying a person in a motivated manner, how to handle such a situation. Let me read that again. Someone is bullying a person in a motivated manner. Oh. How yeah. would you handle oh. such a situation? Well, I'm kind of an expert on that topic, I have to say. And uh, only recently last year, I had to, well, I was engaged to uh, go to a large organization, finance, and um, deal with a, rep well, there were two very senior managers. One was felt bullied by the other. And again, I think sometimes, you know, how would you deal with the situation? Well, you know, you could try all the techniques I said, but what I, no, I have the answer for you because I experienced bullying once in my career and it's not a nice feeling and only once. And I, I, what, I what I learned was if you get a page and you divide it down the center and uh, you put a heading on one side, what I have control over, you put a heading on the other side, what I don't have control over. And you write down everything you have control over, which is what I had to do. And everything I didn't have control over. And what I realized was that I didn't have control over that person's behavior, but I could control my own. So I could avoid doing, it was almost like I was sending, I'll call it him, but it wasn't him, uh, supporting, totally supportive, and being ignored and all of those feelings that come with maybe uh, ignoring as a form of aggression, you know? And um, I found that that helped me enormously. And it, it only takes you maybe 20 minutes to a half an hour. And you start to see, well, I have to let go of what I can't control. You know, you, you have to let go of what you can't control. And you have to focus in on what you can control. And the other option is then, depending on how severe it is, you know, like I have all kinds of techniques, Cindy, for, you know, we, we probably haven't the time, but I would have done training and I'd have a one sheet where, you know, if you're in an organization and you are um, a manager, it's really important to look out for that type of behavior. And you, you know, if, if somebody experiences something like that and they maybe mention it, and they have a kind of a niggle about it and it goes away. And that we've all experienced that and it's nothing. And then maybe something else happens. And then you start talking to your friends and they start talking to their friends and the person knows nothing about it. And at the end of it, then the person goes out sick and they're stressed out of their minds with what's happening. And, you know, the question is for the manager to stay alert for that kind of behavior and offset it before it gets to the serious stage where the person goes sick or leaves the organization and they may be a very valued contributor. Now, I'm not sure if that's helpful to that person, but that's, my, that's what I found to be effective. More, 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 maybe more a contribution than a question. What, what are your three top tips for active listening? How, how, what do you see that can help us with active listening or listening actively? Yeah, and it's like, I suppose with that hospital example, ask questions, you know, 
And, and I find that, you know, if you have a, make statements, it doesn't register with the other person. But if you ask them a question, and again, that's another thing that I've tried and tested, they have to go into their own head to answer you. So that's one of the tips I would say. And then I'd say pay attention, like I said, to what's really going on. So stay alert, pay attention. And I suppose the third one is to that key one that Judith answered was to take time out and reflect on what's going on. And you might even need to get assistance with that, depending on how serious it is. You know, if you need help, go and ask help. Many organizations now have employee assistance programs. They have areas that you can go to, employee relations. And I would say, if it's serious, talk to somebody and get assistance with it, you know. That, that'd be the three. There's many more, I'm sure, you know, Cindy. Thanks for asking. Yeah, yeah, like that one on um, asking instead of telling, because there's still a lot of telling that's going around in corporates, right? Yes. Um, it's changing, definitely changing. But there's a lot of, I think in your words, tell, tell, yell, you know? Yeah. There's a lot of um, telling and, and yelling. And that's at the lower on. level of listening. That's really somebody protecting their own space and not, not like we're talking in coaching about partnering with the client. And in, more, in the workplace, like as Steve Covey has said there, we need to be saying, I have a different opinion, but let's get together and talk about it. Because very often that diffuses everything. It really does, you know. Hmm. I'll just check the chat. Um... Oh, this one. What is the role of relationships in Judith's world? Ish. What is How the role? Of... That? What's the role? It's from, I think I hope I pronounce this right, Chiara. Chiara. Yes. What and is the role the of first... relationships in Judith's world? What is the role of relationships? Um, well, I suppose the relationships is key because she would always say uh, relationship before task. So get to know somebody. And she would always say that, that, you know, focus in on what is it we're about here? What are we trying to achieve? And, and it's interesting that question that's been raised because that's another thing I would have practiced also. I didn't know about that, uh, you know, Judith's sentiment. It was in my time at the hospital before 2006. And I would have always done that. And maybe it's a natural thing in, in a lot of us to, you know, when you meet somebody, you, you, you have the small chat and all of that. So it's relationship before task, and then you agree what you're going to do, you know? I hope that's okay. I'm on mute. Let me What do you think? Um, this participant has asked, what do you think, your opinion? Um, yeah, the chat is moving. Here we go. I'd love to hear something more on what you think or what you have experience of. It's not, it's not that the coachee has to be coachable. So what's your, what's your experience around that? It's not that the coach has to be coachable it's that the coach needs to be coach-able. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I think what that person is saying is that if you engage in a coaching, you know, uh, with a client and that, you know, you need to have a certain amount of skills to be able to coach the person. But also, and it just came to my mind when that question was being asked is, uh, and I got this from Cindy Noble who trained me in conflict coaching is, and it was one thing I picked up on the advanced coaching, conflict coaching, empty your head. I love that saying of hers, empty your head in a coaching session because the focus in a coaching session is on the coachee. And that's what you learn when you're going towards mastery. That, and that's the hard bit. That's the hard bit that you have to practice over and over. And I say, practice that with family. So to make somebody uh, coach the coachable, 
And it's almost like that person is talking about, like, you know, um, Peter Hawkins' seven-eyed model and that. And I instantly think of that too, like about how, you know, if you were to have a helicopter view of what was going on, what was the coach doing? What did the organization want? What did, what happened with the coachee? Is the coach up to the task? And I suppose good training and good practice is what gives you the skills of a mastery. You know, it's, it's a journey. And I would say to anyone on the call who's on that journey, you know, stick with it, practice. And, we're, and I'm still practicing. I'm still practicing listening. As I told you, when the lockdown started with my husband, you know, I was almost divorced and I heard the divorce rate in China went through the roof. I <laughs> don't know if that's true. <laughs> We've got two minutes, a few minutes to go. I do want to invite uh, Magda to close up if she has anything to do so. All right. um, but what I do want to say to you while our coaches, uh, participants are on the call is, you know, on behalf of, behalf of all our participants here and on YouTube, we really thank you. It has been, it's been wonderful engaging with you for the past hour on the topic of listening, partnering, and beautiful examples. Um, thank you. Well, thank Magda? you, Cindy. It's been really good to be here. Thank you all. And thanks to Ram as well. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Um, as usual, this was recorded. So if you missed something, a few of you are having some sound issues, please do pop by our YouTube channel later and you can review this video. And we'll also um, clean up the sound a bit and publish it as a podcast so you will be able to catch up but for anyone who wants to claim CCEUs for this I'm just pasting the link um, both in chat on YouTube and in uh, Zoom that's the link to go and claim your CCEU and the password the keyword that you will enter is listening actively how appropriate um, seeing as that was the topic today but yeah, thank you so much, um, Eilish. I love the nickname from Maja in Chicago. <laughs> Maja, yeah, because I was saying Magda. Sorry, Maja. <laughs> oh, no, it's, it is Magda. It's just, you know, if you're gonna, if we're gonna have cute nicknames, that's I'm mine. Yeah, Magda. because she's Polish. Yeah. You're Polish, right? Uh, I am Polish, you're yes. Polish, Magda. Yeah. yeah. And I think we, we, we more are so. Yeah. And, um, you know, we were uh, earlier talking about how listening, um, what are you noticing with this whole COVID thing happening? And it's, it's, for me, it's really funny because I've done quite a few webinars and things since this lockdown started, but for me, nothing really changed because I work from home. So, and I cook a lot. Uh, oh, so for me, yeah. I, everything is the same pretty much, but um, it's been interesting to kind of witness maybe increase anxiety in other people and maybe like an increased, um, sense of community for good and bad people asking you know are you okay are you okay I'm like yeah I'm okay like nothing's changed it's fine and yeah just for, for me it's been interesting to see how this craziness has for good and mostly for good I think um help people pay more attention to the world around them to their families to their neighbors I've had conversations with neighbors that I haven't I mean I've met their dogs many times <laughs> but I haven't met the neighbors <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, I have. So, you know, um, I think we're all learning to listen a bit more actively in this craziness. And I think that's a good thing. That's definitely true. I yeah, think so. I think so. And good for definitely. the earth, too. So, happy Earth Day, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Thank you all. It's been lovely partnering with you for the past hour or so. And we'll see you next week. Uh, sorry, next month. Next month, same see time next on the leadership webinars. <laughs> We'll see you next week for a different series. So the first month, first Wednesday of the month is our business of coaching series. And um, oh, yeah. we actually, will have, yeah. yeah. So this time next week, we will have Sonal, who is based in Belgium. She's a career coach and um, LinkedIn expert, really cool lady. Uh, she also happens to be a learner with Coach Aria, so she's uh, pursuing her PCC. She's in the coach training program, but I really encourage you guys to come to that one. So even if you already have your coaching business going, this session 
you know, it's from someone who literally helps people build their careers and increase their presence online. Um, I highly encourage you to come to that session. So just go to cocharia.com forward slash events and you will see all the upcoming goodies. And tomorrow I will see you for the parenting with a coaching mindset. Lots of good things happening. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks all everyone. Right. Thank Bye. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. God bless.